you know, my background is as a biomedical scientist in addition to biotech founder and VC. And when I was in the labs, I was always sort of amazed how much even great academic scientists, even at top universities, struggle to get funding. You know, they're across the board starving for funding because most of their funding comes from government sources such as the NIH, National Institutes on Health. It's about a $45 billion a year budget, uh, but it doesn't go that far among the very many scientists that, that are out there. And the pace of increase in NIH budget has not been keeping up with the number of scientists that have been entering the field. Um, so what if there was a different way to fund academic research, the basic research on the fundamental mechanisms of disease and biology, as well as what's called translational research, which is how we go from an understanding of biology to new medicines in the clinic. And government funding, like NIH, does not fund very much translational research on new medicines. They sort of leave that up to industry. But over the last 30 years or so, the biopharma industry has been reducing the amount of early stage research that they finance internally and externally. Um, so there's a huge gap in the market for uh, an alternative source of capital to cross what's called the valley of death. Um, and so, you know, as an academic scientist running a lab, if I were able to apply for grant funding through a new mechanism that was uh, faster than the NIH grants, which takes something like a, you know, up to a year to get uh, funded, and was more translational, developing new medicines rather than basic understanding of biology, um, I think they would love that. In fact, I know they do because they're reaching out to philanthropists all the time um, in a very unstructured way. So part of the plan with Molecule um, and all of the other Web3 entities in the ecosystem, this decentralized science, DSI ecosystem, is to facilitate the translation of basic research into new medicines more effectively, um, and by providing a new source of capital to these academic scientists, um, we can cross that valley of death, where so many drugs, potential drugs, are sitting languishing in universities and tech transfer offices, which are rather bureaucratic. What if we could list all of these grants um, and all of the IP, intellectual property, pre and post patent, if we could list it all in one place where it could be easily found by VCs and biopharma partners and, and any academic could list a project to be funded or to be out licensed on specifically known financial terms. Uh, that would basically create what we were calling an eBay for IP, or just a new marketplace for scientific research. You know, we have pretty functional marketplaces for silly things like, you know, NFTs of photos of apes, for example. Um, but I think, and there, there's a lot of interest in that, but what if we could channel some of that interest in this new type of marketplace into biomedical research that benefits the whole world and the contributors individuals or companies that want to invest in those specific assets would have financial upside over the long term. For example, I'll walk you through how a case uh, of this structure might occur. So Molecule um, is a technology partner for various organizations including DAOs, Decentralized Autonomous Organizations. One such DAO that Molecule has helped launch is VitaDAO, which is focused on longevity uh, and rejuvenation, extending healthy lifespan. Um, and we have cases, many cases, where academics will upload a project, a grant to be funded, and uh, with a detailed budget and timeline and personnel, and we negotiate with their university for ownership of the IP or a license to the IP with predefined financial terms. And then we basically package that asset into an IP NFT, which is freely exchangeable in the marketplace so that anyone can participate and have financial exposure to um, this, this asset, this project. So one example would be, suppose you, know, you have a relative with Alzheimer's disease, for example, or a rare genetic disease. Um, a grant is, is posted on the site 
that you believe has a high probability of working. You can basically contribute financially to it or in kind through other services that you want to provide and support that project directly and ensure that it gets funded and moves toward the clinic. Presently, um, there are a lot of areas that are neglected by the NIH or neglected by the pharmaceutical industry because they're perceived as not commercially attractive enough. Rare diseases are, are one example of that, many rare diseases. Or Alzheimer's, for example. Many big pharmas have shut down their internal CNS uh, brain uh, therapeutic area. Um, and so they're basically leaving society behind. And we have to take matters into our own hands. And we can do it now with these Web3 based tools. We can finance early stage research and participate financially in the upside. So, you know, it's a totally new paradigm and I'm really excited about where it can go. So most academic research funding, basic and translational, comes from government agencies like the NIH. NIH is, um, you know, full of intelligent people, but it's very bureaucratic and it takes a very long time to get a grant funded, and they only fund a small number of the grants uh, that academics apply for. So if you're running a lab, you're spending the vast majority of your time applying for grants again and again and again through different tweaks of the grants and so on. So we're actually having very intelligent, very capable people who should be doing science actually just tweaking these grants and playing this game of getting grants financed by the government. Um, and so it's a huge waste of their their talents and, and time. So um, with Web3 based marketplaces, we can actually decentralize the funding of grants. We can have individual contributors, you or I, or individual companies investing in and financing these different projects. Uh, and, and they're actually liquidly traded, these different assets, um, which allows a certain price discovery. So if you have a really good project and the data are really incredible, the price goes up. And likewise, if someone points out, hey, these data don't look so good, um, the price will go down. So this is you know, the beauty of, of markets in, for example, the biotech sector or publicly listed companies. You can have a whole lot of smart people establishing the price for what that asset should be worth. But we don't have that for preclinical stage assets and for most assets out there that are privately listed and privately held. Um, so one of the advantages to academics is the speed. We can issue one of these grants in a matter of you know, less than a month versus taking a year plus from the NIH. Um, and we have a network of talented people who can contribute ideas and help troubleshoot the experiments and bring on relevant consultants and, and really push this, this project forward. Because they have skin in the game financially, but also many of them are very mission oriented. So if it's a rare genetic disease and their family member has it or their family member has Alzheimer's or what have you, they're really motivated. And pharma and um, a lot of the biotech companies out there have been neglecting certain areas that are not perceived as sufficiently commercially interesting or perceived as too difficult. And so we have to take matters into our own hands. These academics who are in these study sections reviewing grants at the NIH or uh, scientists reviewing potential funding in pharmaceutical companies, they, they have a very specific worldview based on established paradigms. And as we know in science, these paradigms shift from time to time. Um, and one example of this is Alzheimer's disease. You know, for 30 years, the Alzheimer's research community, most of the scientists in the field, have been focusing on this one hypothesis that appears to be false which is the amyloid hypothesis. There's something called amyloid beta in the brain that gums everything up, and if you could only eliminate that from the brain, it would treat Alzheimer's disease. We found time and time again, billions of dollars have been spent finding that this doesn't seem to be the case. And this is largely, the, the advances of science based on these false paradigms is largely due to the centralization and concentration of power. Um, so there was, in the Alzheimer's case, a small number of prominent professors who suppressed 
the funding and advancement of alternative hypotheses about what could be causing Alzheimer's stuff about brain energy metabolism, for example, uh, or infection, infectious agents. And so um, if we just decentralize the decision-making process for who gets funded, we can let a thousand flowers bloom and we can pursue a lot, a, a much greater diversity of approaches. Um, and so, you know, there's been an overall trend of too much centralization of decision-making power within large institutions. And now we have the tools to actually enable the marketplace to determine where we should allocate capital. There are many incredible scientists out there in the U.S., all over the world, who have so many good ideas and they have so many talented junior staff members um, who would like to continue doing science, but they can't because there's not enough grant funding. There's not enough funding available for them. So they have to go do something else entirely and work in a different industry or whatever. We're lo there's a brain drain. We're losing scientists who have been trained for you know 10 years at a time in a very specific area. We're losing them for them to go work on Wall Street or in crypto or something like that, right? Um, so that's, that's a huge waste. So we need to try to retain all of the best talent and attract better talent uh, into the sciences. And uh, one way to do this is to make grant funding uh, more readily available. Um, and one way to do this is sort of uh, an evergreen type structure for particular labs. So suppose there's a lab who has a great track record of developing new medicines um, and they are tired of having to apply to the NIH year in and year out, not knowing whether they're going to get funding and there's being a lot of internal politics at these grant funding bodies and so on. What if they could just issue a token that would, that would grant investors upside in all of the assets, all of the patents and intellectual property that emanates from that lab for a long period of time, say 10, 15 years at a time? And it would be attached to royalties, you know, single digit royalties uh, for all of the contributors. You know, I personally know of dozens of labs that I would love to be able to invest in their IP and sort of have an index fund, like an ETF exposure to all of the IP coming out of that lab. Um, and it would be appreciated by academics because they don't have to waste all of this time applying for grants. And it'd be appreciated by universities because they know they would have consistent income. Um, and it would give the academics freedom to pursue their interests as they change. Whereas with grants from the NIH, you're kind of locked in uh, for, a, for a couple of years to work on something. And that's not how science works. Science, you have to follow your intuitions and plans change very rapidly. So this evergreen structure could allow um, labs to sort of be liberated from a lot of the bureaucracy and allow the general public and, and many different participants and also industry players to have long-term exposure and upside from the asset to the assets coming out of these labs. Drug discovery and development is a very long game. Um, and there are players who operate at the tail end of it quite effectively, big pharma and many large VCs and other investors. But there's a huge valley of death, it's called. There's a huge gap. Um, at the stage where you go from promising academic data to a new spin-out. In there, there usually needs to be some key proof-of-concept experiment, uh, such as financing medicinal chemistry or high-throughput screen or some key animal study. Um, and there's not a lot of funding available for that from government bodies or from VCs. Um, so by filling in this valley of death, it's called, filling that gap, we can get a lot more medicines marching toward the clinic that would otherwise just languish and their patents would expire in the university. And we also allow the general public and various industry partners to get asset-specific exposure. They can do asset-specific financing of various projects, which is very attractive for me as an investor. For example, um, I may not want, suppose there's a company that has five different assets in the pipeline at various stages. And maybe I don't believe in four of those assets, but there's one of those assets I really love. Well, if I can invest specifically in that asset and there's a liquid market to trade uh, fractional ownership in that asset, 
That works as a price discovery mechanism for everybody in the marketplace. That's very useful feedback to the management team too, right? Because they know which assets are most valued by the market. And furthermore, it allows them to sell off additional portions, additional shares of that asset for non-dilutive financing. So it opens up a whole new mechanism for biotech companies, in addition to academic scientists, to fund their work. Everybody knows that biotech is very high risk, but also potentially very high reward. In fact, for the last 20 years, biotech has been outperforming uh, tech software in terms of venture capital returns. Um, but of course, it's very risky if you're investing in a single asset. Um, and so it's often said that diversification is the only free lunch in finance. And so that's one of the really attractive aspects of the DSI ecosystem is you can effectively create almost like an index fund or an ETF with broad-based exposure to a, an entire theme of biotech. So you could have a rare disease entity or a longevity entity or, you know, specifically mitochondrial metabolism or you can get as specific as you'd like. Um, and it, as an investor, I'd love that to be able to bet on certain themes without taking idiosyncratic risk on a particular management team or, or whatever. Um, so there have been, there's been some math, mathematics, conducted by Professor Andrew Lowe at MIT. Um, and he's shown that if you get to a certain number of assets in a portfolio that are um, diversified and uncorrelated, the probability that you will get a drug approved rises exponentially with the number of assets in the portfolio. Um, and this is sort of the model that venture capital funds take and, and big pharmas take. They place a lot of bets on the table at once to mitigate risk. And historically, most retail investors are not able to do that, especially at the early stage uh, level. Um, and so you can effectively build a portfolio that is highly tailored to your interest, what you believe will work. So there are many um, scientists out there who have real insights into the underlying biology that can um, provide a price discovery mechanism for a lot of these assets that are early stage. Uh, so, you know, it's really exciting to see um, a, a real marketplace emerging for early stage biotech assets. Nothing like this has existed previously, and it fills that valley of death gap for academics who need funding to do translational research and are not able to get it from the traditional sources. So Vita Dow is, I think, one of the coolest DAOs out there that I've seen. It's investing in longevity biotech um, and building a broad portfolio of fundable grants and collaborations with biotech companies all over the world. So it provides a very diversified portfolio uh, that any participant in the DAO can have exposure to and can govern what happens with those projects. Um, and so, you know, I've been impressed by the quality of talent, you know, scientists and professors and many very talented people just sort of hearing about VitaDAO and getting involved um, and taking the initiative to drive these projects forward. It's sort of a permissionless structure, right? So it's not hi very hierarchical and people can just run with a project and we vote on it as a community and then it gets funded. Um, so, you know, there are some examples uh, of projects in universities that have data around a molecule that we believe will extend healthy lifespan. And for example, they have data that it extends a healthy lifespan of some model organisms like mice in the lab. Uh, for example, one project we funded recently is around the enhancement of autophagy. Autophagy is this process of cellular recycling. When you do fasting and exercise, it turns on autophagy where the cell breaks down its internal components and then rebuilds them. Um, and this is well known to extend healthy lifespan and be protective in many diseases. So one of the projects we financed, financed recently is to um, further develop some of these compounds that enhance autophagy. Uh, and this uh, kind of research has gotten the attention of industry partners, including some big pharmas who will go unnamed, who've reached out to us 
asking to learn more about our portfolio in the interest of collaborating and even proposing to outlicense to VitaDAO some of the assets on their shelves because they're too bureaucratic to carry them forward themselves or their st strategy has shifted. So there's a huge opportunity to create a large evergreen pool of capital that is more democratically governed than, say, a venture fund or a big corporation in which patients uh, or relatives of patients or scientists with specific expertise in a particular disease area can directly vote and directly govern where that capital is allocated. So VitaDAO is just one of many new DAOs being formed to invest in specific themes, in this case longevity. Um, and being a longevity scientist myself, I love to see it and to see how many people it's bringing into the field. And the access to um, a large number of people as contributors and uh, contributing their skills and financially opens up the whole world to this asset. So instead of being a venture fund or a publicly listed company where you have a limited number of potential investors, you can constantly raise capital and constantly distribute the capital. And when you have a success, one of the drugs makes it to market or you outlicense the asset to a pharma partner, you can reinvest that capital into the DAO.